Welcome back to the Uncharted X podcast. This is Ben, and I have a very special guest for this episode. Someone who should need no introduction to most of you, author and journalist Graham Hancock. Over the last 30 years, Graham has written a number of books spanning several different subjects, but is perhaps best well known for his groundbreaking work exploring the possibility for a lost ancient civilization. One that was both global and advanced in nature, existing prior to the great cataclysm of the Younger Dryas some 12,800 years ago, and long before the known ancient civilizations in our mainstream story of human history. Beginning with Fingerprints of the Gods in 1995, Graham first suggested the possibility of a global cataclysm based on evidence from ancient cultures and sites around the world. But it wasn't until 2006, when the first of what is now more than 200 peer-reviewed scientific papers were published, vindicating his work with the establishment of the Younger Dryas Cosmic Impact Hypothesis. Hancock explored this work extensively in 2015 with his sequel, Magicians of the Gods, and in 2019 followed that up with the publication of America Before, The Key to Earth's Lost Civilization where he tackles the mystery of the lost history of the American continent, and it's a highly recommended read. You can find much more information, links to all of his books, and lots of great posts and a very active discussion forum over on Graham's website, which is grahamhancock.com. Personally speaking, I have much to thank Graham for. His work served as a source of inspiration for me, and after having had the privilege of travelling with him through Peru and Bolivia, first in 2013, and then through Egypt in 2015, I made the decision to quit a 20-year career in IT and pursue my own investigations into the mysteries of our past full-time, which, along with being a radical and risky life change, ultimately led to the creation of this channel. As surreal and challenging as it is at times, these last several years have been intensely interesting and gratifying, and I really wouldn't swap it for anything. So, many thanks to Graham for his work, and also for sharing some of his valuable time with me. I hope you all enjoy the conversation. All right, what an absolute pleasure. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to, to welcome Graham Hancock to the podcast. Graham, it's great to see you. Nice to be back with you, Ben. Indeed, yes. Thanks for taking the time to, uh, to talk with me today. Uh, yeah, very much looking forward to it. I have been for a few years. I know we've been going back and forth a little bit, trying to make we it happen. Have been <laughs> playing email tag on this, uh, on this interview for a couple for about of years. Four years or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I did. So I, I did manage to, I think I saw you briefly in 2019 on, it must have been a whirlwind experience for you on your book tour uh, for America Before. I was on the book tour for America Before. Yeah, it was a whirlwind experience. Yeah, yeah. as book tours always are. I bet they are. Yeah. And I wanted to tell everyone too, if you haven't got it, very, re very much recommend getting this. Uh, it, it, very, it moves all of the work that Graham's done in uh, Fingerprints and Magicians Forward. It's a, it's a great book. Uh, I, I've certainly got a lot of questions for it. But one thing I, I did want to maybe start with was and this has to do with, it's, it's a bit of a thank you. You probably hear this from a lot of people, but it, it also leads to a question, which is, you know, you, you, your, it's your work. And in particular, the, the, I just, the privilege that I had to travel with you through Peru in 2013 and then Egypt again in 2015, yeah. uh, that really led me to a massive life change. So, I, you know, I, I, after 2015, just apt, and I'd been increasingly more enthralled and drawn into this world of ancient civilizations and, and mysteries that surround them. And it was 2016, I more or less quit my job in IT and I've been doing you know, full-time investigation and trying to scratch a living out of the internet from it, I guess, uh, ever since. And um, you know, it's, it's led me to some incredible experiences. I've got to know Randall Carlson and travel with him, Chris Dunn, Tony Zamora, a whole bunch of, of, of people. Uh, yeah. So I, I kind of have you to thank for all of that. Just I wanted to get that out of the way up front. So, well, Thank you indeed. I, I, I appreciate it. Glad to have played some role in your transformation. Indeed, indeed, you have. So, the uh, the uh, let me just move this. The um, the one thing that that I wanted to start with was that the, the trip in in Egypt in 2015 was something that opened my eyes, uh, in particular to I guess kind of the the mainstream's resistance to to yes. to new ideas that challenge the existing paradigm of of history. And you know, yeah. this was the the location for that infamous Zahi Hawass debate. And it yeah. was a you know it was a an eye opening experience from the perspective of I noticed that there's a real lack of, of willingness to kind of engage. And ever since I've been digging into it, that's. Well, it was, that's... it was, a, it was a curious thing. I, I, in many ways, I wish I could, I wish I could do it over because 
you know, Zahi has has be has sort of come comes across in certainly in the alternative history movement as a bit of a hate figure. But just like you and me, he's a human being, yes. you know, with his own hopes and his own ambitions and his own fears and and um, his own dedication to his his own work. And actually, when we set up that debate, it was done in good faith. I hadn't really had an argument with Zahi for some years before that, and we thought it would be it would be interesting to to do a debate. He was he was engaged and interested, but then. The, what, what happened was that we were, I, I, I was just uh, trying out my slides for my presentation in the, in, the, in the assembly room before the event began. And Zahi turned up early as well. And he saw that I was doing one about Robert Boval's Orion correlation. And, um, and he went ballistic. He got very, very, very upset uh, about, about that. And, and um, that, was, that encounter was filmed. Uh, and and uh, the footage was uh, was was put on the internet, and and uh, since since then Zahi is just determined that I never come back to Egypt, um, and that and that's most unfortunate because I I wish that there could be more constructive dialogue of the kind I thought we were going to have yeah. between those of us who are seriously looking at an alternative view of, of history and prehistory and uh, ma mainstream figures instead of instead of this uh, sort of very dual du this duality this uh, sort of division between one side and the other I, I would prefer to see us all all cooperating and it builds up a lot of bad will and bad feeling I understand archaeologists getting very upset with me because I say some pretty sharp things about archaeologists sometimes um, where I where I feel they've failed to do their their jobs properly, um, and uh, you know they 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 respond with very with very sharp comments to, towards towards me in an attempt to sort of dismiss all of my work and the work of the work of others who are working seriously in this field. Um, the the first strategy of the mainstream is just to dismiss it, and I think this is I think this is most unfortunate. I would love to have another debate with Zahi Hawass. Uh, an honest and open debate, properly curated, properly moderated, uh, where each side can pre present its point of view with dignity and 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 decency, and where we can, you know, we can all leave there friends instead of massively upset and 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 furious with each other and effectively cancelling a debate, which is which is what happened. Indeed, yeah, and I I would love to see that as well. I mean, I, it's it's a question I want to ask is is kind of why you think there's such resistance because something I've noticed in, in the research that I've done is that it's almost like it's a modern phenomena of archaeology, maybe the last 50 years, perhaps even less, that there is such a, like a hard line. And it's, as I think, as you mentioned in America before, there's, there's almost, almost a fear in some researchers to, to challenge some of these paradigms, despite the last 20 years really throwing up just well, tremendous evidence, you know, from not just archaeology, yeah. but adjacent fields of science, climate history, genetic yeah. timelines, things like that. Yeah, it, I, I, saw, I saw a quotation on this. I forget who it was from, which kind of which kind of rung, rung a bell. Um, in in evolution, you know, when you have a species that occupies a particular ecological niche, um, it's very difficult for that niche to be filled by anybody else until the former species has gone extinct. Um, <laughs> other, otherwise, it, otherwise it completely occupies that niche and and refuses to allow any competitors in. And and I think that that is. You know that is where we are with um, with mainstream archaeology and mainstream prehistory. That a niche has been carved out by a group of academics, and they see themselves threatened and challenged by others who are who are who are not academics. Actually, none of none of us right. really challenging this are are, are, are academics. Uh, and the the main project is to keep us out and and not to have and and that's why it was in a way so sad and so symbolic what happened with Zahi because there was an opportunity for both sides to have a reasonable and sensible discussion, find out what the points of difference were, find out if there were any points of agreement and see if we could move forward constructively. Um, and that's what I would love to see happen, but unfortunately it just it just doesn't it doesn't happen. Uh, and, and we end up with this sort of war of all against all uh, going on endlessly and achieving absolutely nothing. Yeah, that's right. It's just sort of spinning our wheels. I mean, and, what, and I, what, I, what I'm finding is that that I am, you know, I'm getting banned from working on uh, quite a number of uh, archaeological sites around the world. Um, and this is this is. Um, uh, to me, uh, a, a form of perhaps the worst form of censorship, 
uh, archaeologists have control of access to archaeological sites. That's right. And what a clever way for them to get rid of critics is just to allow, never to allow those critics any access to those sites. Um, it's, it's really not the way things, things should work. I've come to realize that history and prehistory are really ideological subjects. There's a whole ideology tied up with this, and that ideo ideology dominates the debate. Yeah, it does, and it's it's a it's it's a strange thing to me because it's like I, I study a lot of like figures like Flinders Petrie, and it and perhaps it's got something to do with the nature of the debate and the rise of the internet. Like they, as I, I look at a lot of like historical uh, previous era Victorian era explorers and archaeologists and Egyptologists, they seem to be much more willing to acknowledge when there's mystery and when there's things we don't understand versus today. I mean, I can I can almost understand it a little bit given that. The, the debate used to happen in those academic you know halls of residence and, and with their peers and colleagues and now it's this wide open field of the internet where anyone you know like me or journalists like you can can come in and and sort of have yeah. their say and, and get some audience and traction so to some extent i can almost understand this the 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 narrowing of that middle ground and that that area of where where the real answer is i don't know and we should do more research becomes yeah. i'm we know what happened there's no mystery here you know there's the case is closed kind of thing Yes, I, it is. It, to my mind, it is a it is a most unfortunate thing. Is that part of the mission of mainstream archaeology and, and prehistory seems to be to drain the past of all its mystery, yeah. to turn it into this sort of sort of bloodless, colorless <laughs> yeah. entity which has been sucked dry of all of, of 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 all its mystery and all its magic, and 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 left as a sort of dull, repetitive, rote uh, academic study. And yeah. and I. I think that's really sad because because the engagement of the public with the past depends on mystery and we can't just have sanctioned mysteries you know mysteries that there are mysteries that are okay according to the mainstream and other mysteries that aren't okay and and it should it it shouldn't be that case it's up to us in in the alternative side of this of this division uh to up our game to do to do excellent work to do the best work we can to research thoroughly um, but we would like to have a proper and reasoned discussion Indeed. with the mainstream about this. And I think I speak not only for myself, but for, for many of my colleagues in this field. We don't want it to go on being a hate fest. No. We, would like it, we would like it to be much more constructive. A man like Zahi Hawass has got a lifetime of experience working on the Giza Plateau. Yeah. He's enormously knowledgeable. Um, in many ways, he's a, he's a very... <laughs> He's quite a fascinating character. I, I, I quite like him. And I was very sad when that happened because I saw that as an opportunity for a new way forward. And instead it ended up in as a, as, as a complete dead end, yeah. uh, which is, which, which is most, most unfortunate. Indeed. Yeah. And it, I, the other I minute mean, to me, it, it almost, it, I think this unwillingness to embrace some of that mystery almost, also limits progress because you know, there's there's a we tend to I, I, the way I view a lot of mainstream archaeology and 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 Egyptology in particular is this constant desire to look at it through that lens of we, you know it's everything we we have to be able to understand and classify everything that happened in the past from within our own perspective of our own technology of our own civilization as some sort of inferior subset of what we know versus yes. I think there are some true mysteries that if we embraced them and investigated them with an open mind, we might stand yeah. to actually learn something and progress our own knowledge base. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, one of the ways, one of the ways that the mainstream deals with this, and it's interesting, uh, I don't want to carp on about this too much, sure. but, yeah, it, we can but it's on. interesting the way that mainstream archaeology and prehistory has a grip, for example, on Wikipedia. Uh, yes. Now, Wikipedia yeah, well. is, the, is the first port of call for almost anybody who's looking for information on a subject they don't know about. Uh, and for that port of call to be in controlled by an ideological faction that have a particular vested interest in a particular view of the past is, is most unfortunate. It is. Uh, and yet that is, uh, that is the case. You find, for example, that the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis cannot get a fair deal on Wikipedia. That's right. They constantly try to diss it and to cut it down. Uh, although that is not the role of an encyclopedia, an encyclopedia's role is simply to report the facts. And in my in my case, they they try to to just write me off at the outset by calling me a pseudo historian or a pseudo archaeologist or a or a pseudo scientist. 
And, and, and with that word, for, for a person who's coming to my work for the first time, the first thing they see is Wikipedia. The most likely thing they're going to do is say, well, we're not going to look further into, into Hancock's work. And that clearly is the objective uh, of, uh, of the Wikipedia project, of the way that they, that they cover this, is to, is to just get rid of all inquiry right at the outset and stick, and stick with the mainstream all the time. And yet, you know, as the years have gone by, like, I wrote fingerprints, published Fingerprints of the Gods in 2000, in 1995, 26 years ago, more than quarter of a century ago. Yeah. I published, yeah. I published Fingerprints of the Gods. God, it makes me. I was, oh. in, high, I was in high school. <laughs> and, and in Fingerprints of the Gods, I, I, I proposed that there had been a, a, a giant geological cataclysm somewhere around 12,000 years ago. Uh, and that um, it had uh, wiped out most of the traces of a previously advanced civilization of the of, of, of the Ice Age. And I looked at a number of possibilities for that cataclysm. But the main yeah. thing that I wanted to make a point was, if you're going to talk about a lost civilization, you need to talk about a cataclysm as well. Civilizations don't just disappear. Things happen to them. Right. And, and uh, the interesting thing is that there was no evidence for such a cataclysm when I published Fingerprints of the Gods in, in 1995. Right. But from 2007 onwards, there has been a massive amount of evidence, and that is the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, and it's mainstream science. When I report the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, I'm reporting mainstream science. To report mainstream science is not pseudoscience, right. um, but but nevertheless, that is that is how that is how it is is treated. So, in Fingerprints of the Gods, 1995, I propose a gigantic geological cataclysm around 12,000 years ago. Everybody says this is absolute rubbish; uh, it's total pseudoscience, couldn't happen. Then we find out from 2007 that the episode called the Younger Dryas, whatever caused it, and I'm personally convinced by the comet hypothesis, but there are other possibilities, was truly a global cataclysm with massive sea level rise and huge devastation of uh, wildlife, of the megafauna, and also of, of, of human populations. So actually, in proposing a global cataclysm around 12,000 years ago in Fingerprints of the Gods, I wasn't wrong. Uh, I was, I, I turned out to be more or less right. You were, yeah, uh, totally vindicated. You know, t totally vindicated on the on, on the date. There, there's there's no recognition of that in, in the work of those who call me and want to call me a pseudoscientist and to diminish and, mini and minimize more than quarter of a century of, of my work. Uh, another example is the Great Sphinx in Fingerprints of the Gods. Nice. Of course, I'm not the original originator of this, John Anthony West and Robert Schock. Uh, Robert Schock actually is a scientist. He's a professor of geology at Boston University. John Anthony West, great friend of mine, the late, yeah. great John Anthony West, was a, was a sort of rogue scholar uh, who, who just brought a whole new understanding to Egypt. And it was he who first proposed that the, the weathering patterns on the Sphinx suggested that, that it was much older than 2500 BC. Indeed. And Robert Schock came in and fundamentally confirmed that from a geological point of view. What does the archaeological community do? They, they <laughs> dismiss it. They pour scorn on it. They say it's rubbish. And their argument is as follows. They say, oh, it's impossible for the Sphinx to be 12,000 years old because there was no civilization anywhere in the world 12,000 years ago that was create, capable of creating monuments on a gigantic scale like the Sphinx. They're saying that in 1995. Again, fast forward to the 2000s, and we have the discovery and the excavation of Gobekli Tepe. And Gobekli Tepe now excavated by the German Archaeological Institute, a massive megalithic site, really, really on an unbelievable scale, <laughs> dates firmly to 11,600 years ago. That's absolutely in the 12,000 year ago window. And, and if, you know, if we have a culture which we now accept could create Gobekli Tepe 11,600 years ago with its 20 ton megaliths and its perfect astronomical alignments, then they would have had no problem in creating the Sphinx as well. So that argument that there was no culture in the world that was capable of creating large scale monuments 12,000 years ago goes out the window. And again, this is, this is not recognized. We're, we're not making progress in this field because there's a rigid dogmatic approach to the past. Mainstream academics have got locked in a particular perspective and they find it very, very difficult to let that perspective go. And I understand human nature and I get it. I, I get it. We all get attached to our own positions. I'm no exception. I'm, I'm attached to my own position too. But 
the one difference I think between me and academics in this field is I do not insist that everything I say is 100% right. I might be wrong. I might be making mistakes. What I'm trying to do is to provide a reasoned, critical alternative to the mainstream view of the past. And I believe that's a useful service. Indeed. It's a service, it's a service that's worthwhile uh, offering. Uh, and 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 unfortunately, it just it just leads to this endless recriminations and problems and difficulties. And it's no and it's no way to proceed. And frankly, I think mainstream archaeology should be ashamed of itself for the way that it for the way that it behaves. We know so little about the past. You go back to five thousand years ago or earlier. We don't really have any written documents. Perhaps the earliest Sumerian documents go back six thousand years ago. Nothing. No written documents have survived from that time. Everything that we understand about the past is pieced together from little artifacts dug out of the ground. Um, and, and, and frankly speaking, even in archaeology, which regards itself as a science, not a pseudoscience, but a real science, they make many, many mistakes. And I drew attention to that in America before, the, 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 the Clovis first paradigm, oh, yeah. the notion that the Native American culture that archaeologists call the Clovis culture was the first, were the first human beings to inhabit the Americas, was cast in stone, an absolutely rigid dogma of archaeology. And for many years, for decades actually, it resisted new evidence, which showed that people had been in the Americas much longer than that. And those who proposed that new evidence, who brought that new evidence to the table, like Jacques Saint Mars at Bluefish Caves in the Yukon, they were destroyed by the mainstream academy, utterly destroyed. Their research funding was withdrawn. They, they weren't allowed to speak at conferences anymore. The whole academic world just united against them to, to destroy them. And, that, and then we find actually they were right. Yes. They were right all along. And, and instead of making that progress 20 or 30 years earlier, we went through 20 or 30 years of unnecessary, useless delay caused by the ego and the absolute rigidity of the spokespeople of the mainstream. Yeah. And, and this is not how it should be. The past is a, is, is, is a shared human resource. It does not belong to archaeologists. It does not belong to historians. It belongs to all of us. And we all have a vested interest in finding out the truth about the past. Uh, and it's wrong of the mainstream to say that the alternative side has nothing to offer in this field. We do have questions to offer, and we do increasingly have very solid evidence, That's which right. is not explained by the mainstream paradigm. And generally in science, if you go on long enough, when a paradigm is not supported by new evidence, when new evidence keeps on contradicting that paradigm, that paradigm eventually will get dumped. Yeah. And I think the paradigm of our prehistory as a species is eventually going to get dumped. Uh, the paradigm that is taught in universities at the moment, but Indeed. we haven't reached that point yet. It's still a struggle. Yeah, yeah indeed. Very well said. I, I, I agree. And I think it's, it's a, the other part that, that seems true to me uh, over time is that as far as science goes and, and including you know, archaeology, I guess, as, as it, even though it's not so much a hard science, but is that the, the new discoveries come from the fringe. I mean, that's, that's how the, those existing paradigms get challenged. And you can go, you know, way back, the, the, the heliocentric model is probably a great example, uh, discovery of, of bacteria and the, the reason to, to wash your hands as a doctor. I mean, and, and in recent times, as you, as you mentioned, uh, bluefish caves, the challenging yeah. of the Clovis Doctrine, but also things like, you know, J. Harlan Bretts and catastrophism, yeah. these guys getting getting laughed plate, out plate, of the room. Plate, but, but Plate tectonics, which yeah. is a universally accepted theory of yeah. geology today, was regarded as pseudoscience in the 1920s. Right. You know, and, and it was dismissed and held back for, 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 for decades because of that. This is, this is again and again the case, and I don't understand why the academy can't learn some lessons from this and have a little bit more humility, mm -hmm. a little bit of willingness to listen to the intelligent, educated man in the street who has questions to ask mm -hmm. and alternative point of views to present. But unfortunately, yeah. this is not the situation we're in. Well, it's something that, as you said, I think it's it's becoming an overwhelming tide of new evidence at this point because, uh, and there is it's it's the one thing that eventually I think we have to acknowledge that there is just so much new evidence now, particularly in the last twenty years, coming from adjacent fields of science as well as discoveries in the field like Gobekli Tepe. But you know now that the the younger Dryas impact is up to over two hundred peer reviewed papers, most of them vastly on the on the positive side. 
Uh, and even the ones that are negative have been, I think, counted quite effectively. I've had some long conversations with George Howard uh, yeah. about, about this as well. Uh, and, and even recently, uh, there's been a discovery, and uh, Antonio Zamora did a good video on it, of a, of a massive global um, Y chromosome bottleneck in human populations that, co yeah. that coincides to that younger Dryas. Now, the, the authors of that paper didn't, didn't, didn't tie it to the younger Dryas. They tied it to somehow just a, a magical kind of global cultural shift <laughs> around the world, but Antonio did. And yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, it becomes very hard to resist. And then, yeah, you know, obviously you have challenges with things like Wikipedia that are controlled by the mainstream. I've, I've dug into that in the past as well. But yeah, this, yeah. The, the tide of evidence just, I think at some point has got to become overwhelming. Uh, and I think it is, it is getting there now. Um, and what I've noticed is that the younger generation of archaeologists, I do, when I go around giving giving my my, my talks, I was going to ask you I this. Yeah. America before in 2019, quite quite often I'll find young archaeologists have turned up at my talks, and their outlook is very different from yeah. their elders. Um, they're they're much more curious, much more open minded. They don't want to just commit to an existing set of teachings without finding out more for themselves. You know, it's just not just a matter of receiving the teaching and reproducing it. They actually want to get to grips with the material directly themselves. That's but great. it's a it's a kind of self fulfilling prophecy in the academic career, um, because if you if you don't repeat what what your seniors and elders have told you. Uh, if you challenge that, then you're unlikely to even get your degree. You know? Indeed, you're, yeah. Uh, uh, and if you get a degree, it's likely to be marked down, and God forbid that you would get any research funding or anything like that. You know? Indeed, yeah. I, I've had a couple of similar conversations and emails. I've, I've both been contacted by some, some uh, archaeologists working in the field that don't want to discuss some of this stuff publicly, even though they're, they're, they find it plausible. But then a lot of younger students that I, I've, I've been... Uh, um, privileged enough for them to contact me and say that, that you know, they're open-minded to it. So maybe it's Planck's theorem at work here, but I also have some hope for the next generation of, of, uh, of uh, archaeologists in this field. I've, so. got, I've got very, very high hopes for it. I think, I think things will, will change. I'm not sure if I'll see it in my lifetime, but I think the, um, I think the stepping stones have been laid down uh, and, and the, the, the challenges have been, have been made clear. Um, my own view very strongly is that there is something major missing from our prehistory. We, we mm -hmm. got a big missing chapter. And once we, once we consider that, then things that don't make sense suddenly start to make sense. Gobekli Tepe doesn't make sense on its own. It has to be part of something much larger. It's there 11,600 years ago. Um, we now know that there are a number of other sites in the area that Karahan are dating Tepe. back to the to the like Karahan Tepe, which I've had the privilege to visit, which are which are dating back to to the same to the same period. And it's obvious that something very extraordinary was going on in Turkey at that time. And and what's puzzling about it is that all the evidence shows us a population who are entirely hunter gatherers before Gobekli Tepe is created. And then Gobekli Tepe is created. And at the same time, they switch from hunter gathering to agriculture. They start making the switch. Um, so we have two mysteries here. We have, we have agriculture suddenly blossoming, blossoming in, in, in Turkey uh, around 11,600, 12,000 years ago. Um, and, and, um, and we have uh, a megalithic site on an enormous scale that is built at that time, and neither of them have any background. They just seem to right. come out of nowhere. Yeah. But there must be a background. What Gobekli Tepe has always looked like to me, and I'm just this is just my opinion. I don't claim it's a fact like our archaeologist friends. I'm simply stating my opinion, looking at it, having worked through many, many sites around the world. My opinion at Gobekli Tepe is we're looking at a transfer of technology. We're looking at evidence that people who already knew how to create megaliths came to that area and began to teach those skills to the local hunter-gatherer population. And those people also knew about agriculture and they taught agriculture at the same time, maybe even 
pure speculation. Maybe the creation of that enormous megalithic site was used as a focal point, as a place to mobilize populations, to give them a, a, an interest and an investment and a big project to be engaged in, which would automatically create more organization of labor uh, and, and then spread that out to agriculture. But it's fascinating that the site comes first and the agriculture comes second. Indeed. The normal, again, if we go back to the established paradigm, uh, of prehistory, archaeologists will tell you that megalithic sites required a population that was already agricultural, that had uh, evolved to such an extent that they could organize labor, that they were generating surpluses, that they could free people from the labor of agriculture and allow them to become specialist engineers or, or architects or or, or, or astronomers. That's supposed to be the setting. And Gobekli Tepe doesn't fit into that setting. It challenges that setting. And rather than just saying, oh, well, this is a bit of a problem, but let's ignore it. It would be, it would be much better to say, well, how actually can we explain this? Uh, and one explanation, a reasonable explanation is a transfer of technology. That uh, when you see a sudden change like that with no background, you have to consider the possibility that it's been introduced to that area. Indeed. And I mean, that's also a premise that's reflected in the, I guess, the, the myths and legends of so many other cultures, right? You, you have these stories of great civilizers and these like All demigod types of people, Viracoshas and the Shemsu Hor and Zeptepi in but Egypt. Quetzalcoatl, the feathered but, serpent, you know, Osiris yeah. in Egypt. These are these are all figures. They're so similar all, yeah. all around the world. And, and, and their mission in, in every case is to reignite civilization after a, a global catastrophe. Uh, and, and yet archaeology tells us to ignore all of these myths and traditions from the past, that they're just fantasies of the ancients, that, uh, that there never was any... I mean, archaeologists will, will say that there never was any flood. Well, I'm sorry, there was, there a, was flood. a flood. <laughs> sea level rose 400 feet between the end of the last ice age and, 10, 000, and, and 11,600 years ago. 400 yeah. foot rise in sea level. There 27 million square kilometers of land yeah. swallowed, the best land on earth, the coastal lands, swallowed up by those rising seas. Yeah. You know, yeah. that is a flood. Yeah, and and it, it didn't come all at once. It came in a series of episodes. But there was a big episode right at the beginning of the Younger Dryas, 12,800 years ago. And there was an even bigger episode 11,600 years ago at the end of the Younger Dryas. And that, 11,600 years ago, as I'm sure you know, is the date that Plato gives us for the submergence of Atlantis. Atlantis. Yes, This right. cannot be a coincidence. That's right. it, it, if it's a coincidence, it's an extraordinary one that we have this Greek philosopher who speaks <laughs> of the visit of his ancestor Solon to Egypt mm -hmm. in in a date that in our calendar is around 600 BC. And Solon is told by Egyptian priests the story of Atlantis and brings that story back to Greece and Plato eventually reports it to us. And when, when Solon asked those Egyptian priests uh, who, who spoke of the flooding and destruction of Atlantis, when did they happen? They, when did this happen? They said quite matter of factly, oh, 9,000 years ago. Well, that was in 600 BC. So that's 9,600 BC. In other words, 11,600 years ago. In other words, the date of Gobekli Tepe. I mean, either this is just a coincidence beyond belief or there's something really spooky going on here. Plato was so right. That is meltwater pulse 1b. Yeah. Ask any geologist when meltwater pulse 1b occurred and they'll tell you 11,600 years ago. <laughs> Maybe, um, maybe, maybe Plato had an ice core from uh, Greenland or something like that that he was working some, from. <laughs> something, something, something like that. And yet the mainstream tries to dismiss Plato's Atlantis story as yet another one of those fantasies. Well, we're running out of excuses to dismiss the stories Indeed. of the past. We need to listen to the testimony of the ancients. We can't claim to have grasped and understood the past if we don't listen to what the ancients had to say. And there's hardly a culture anywhere in the world right. that doesn't speak of a lost civilization, of a great civilization, of a golden age, of a flood that brought it to an end. Yeah, flood, flood or fire. And it's, I, I think that there are more or less eyewitness accounts of some of this stuff in, encoded in these myths and legends from around the world, be it flood or fire. I mean, and, and yeah. if you think about the nature of human humanity when you're in an era where it's it's oral tales we're not writing things down you don't encode just data you you deify things you put a story and a framework around them and that's how you pass data down through generations and it ends well, up one, looking like one, it is one yeah. of the one of the ways that's that's one of the ways if you if you have information that you wish to transmit to the future one of the ways to transmit it is to put it into a story a story that people will keep on telling. And of course, the story will be, will, will be full, full of symbolic elements. 
But if the story is good and it grips people's imagination, it will go on being told, even if those who are telling it don't really understand what it's about anymore. And it'll be there, it'll survive for thousands of years and, and can eventually be looked at again. And we need to look at these stories of the ancients. We need to look at these stories of global flood, global cataclysm, and indeed fire. And that is why uh, the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis uh, is is such an intriguing answer to all of these problems and needs to be taken incredibly seriously by archaeologists. That's right. Um, yeah. Just just for, for for your listeners, the the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis refers to a, a period of uh, geological history called the geologists call the Younger Dryas. It's actually named after a particular species of alpine flower that flourishes in cold conditions. And, and the, the Younger Dryas sets in suddenly 12,800 years ago, and it ends equally suddenly 11,600 years ago. 12,800 years ago, the world has been emerging from the Ice Age for several thousand years. Things have been getting warmer. In fact, it's almost as warm 12,800 years ago as it is today, although there's still a lot of ice caps left. And then this sudden change of climate, a massive deep freeze, huge extinctions of animal species, a very mysterious rise in sea level. Normally, when you get a freeze, you don't get a rise in sea level because the water is all frozen. Yeah. So that, now, we, now we must invoke some kind of heat source to explain how in the, at the onset of a huge global deep freeze, an enormous amount of water is released into the world ocean. The best explanation for that is the comet impact hypothesis, which is the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, so suggesting that the Younger Dryas was caused by multiple impacts from fragments of a disintegrating comet. Yes. That's yeah. what that's what set it set it on its course. Yeah, it needed we needed some and this is something I've discussed with Randall uh, quite a bit is that there's we needed some injection of energy to that system because there is a real paradox here for for geologists about how all that ice melted because if you took even if you took all of that ice that that contributed to that 400 foot sea level rise and even 10 or 10 or 15,000 years ago you plopped it in the warmest water in the world say on the around Indonesia it would still be it would take something like 30,000 years to melt just yeah. sitting in warm water and and it melted in a fairly short period of time and as you said in these in these giant bursts and you know if ever yes. anybody wants evidence of catastrophic flooding get yourself up to the channeled scablands in eastern washington state in the in the united states it's a it's an incredible landscape first of all but once you understand the events that that shaped that landscape it's just it's a mind-blowing experience to get up there and actually see it for yourself it's i, I, mean, I had the privilege of making that journey with randall carlson yeah. and i think you've done something something have, similar yeah. and, you know randall is just such an acute observer of the geological landscape really and is. things that you might miss he points them out to you and you suddenly realize that what you're looking at is current ripples that are you know <laughs> hundreds of feet yeah. oh. long and 40 or 50 feet high, the kind of ripples that you get on a beach on a very small scale, we find in the channeled scablands on an utterly gigantic scale, but they're caused by the same thing, the recession of floodwaters. Indeed. Uh, yeah. and, 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 you know, suddenly you start looking at the whole world in a different, in a different framework. And, and we need to remind ourselves that cataclysms are a regular part of life on Earth, that they have driven life on Earth for not just for millennia, but for millions of years. Uh, and perhaps it's not surprise, not so surprising that a cataclysm intervened in the human story. Right. Yeah, it, and we that's right. We're learning that they happen much more frequently than we think we did, which kind of leads me to a, another question for you that, I've, that I really have always wanted to ask, which is, which has to do with the importance of of understanding our past. Why uh, figuring out this mystery is 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 important? Because for me, it's. I think it's, it almost feels like in our civilization, our modern technological driven world, our, I think you termed it an electromechanical approach to problem solving. You know, we, it's as if I think most people go through life as if it's a, funda it's like a fundamental tenet of, of, of existence here is that we're on some preordained path. We've come from the Stone Age directly to here. This is the way that civilizations go. And I think yeah. that if there was a, a, a more general acceptance that, oh, no, like hu humanity's risen to great heights in the past only to have been just struck down and destroyed by, by cataclysm, it might change. It's an altruistic, as all hell, this goal, but it maybe it might change to help some of our traje trajectory, some of our priorities, well, think, and think, maybe spend a little less money on tanks and a little more money on you know, exploring the heavens kind of thing. Exactly, exactly. And, 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 and also on mitigating man-made disasters as well. You know? Right. 
uh, because cataclysms don't only come from the cosmos they they can oh, also yeah. be created by a species <laughs> like our like ourselves um all, all, all of this is true yeah so yeah that's that's i i I just that's I think there's a, I'm trying to figure out how to how to frame that like why this stuff is important because some people kind of brush off the historical perspective. It's important first of all, first of all at a personal level. Um, every one of us likes to know our family background, where we where we came from. We often can't trace it back very far. I I can't trace my own family back beyond my great grandfather. I don't know. Oh, I've heard vague rumors about what happened before then, but but we like to situate ourselves in in some way. It helps to give us a sense of who we are and and, and where we are. Uh, and if this is true at an individual level, it's also true at the level of the human race. We want to know where we came from, how we got here, how we got into this position. And it's an ideological position of the mainstream to depict uh, the, the human story of one of more or less constant progress with a few little dips here and there, more or less constant progress, as, as John Anthony West used to put it, you know, from from the stone age to us today with our striped toothpaste and whatever, <laughs> but it's not, it, it, this is ideology. This is not, this is not a fact. This is how we wish things would be. Right. This is also part of the problem is that we constantly look for ourselves in the past. Uh, and if we don't find ourselves, then we automatically define those cultures as primitive. Whereas there's many ways to be sophisticated. Ours is, ours is just one. And uh, it, it's lacking in many important qualities that, that a civilization uh, should have. But the worst thing of all is this arrogance, this sense that we have, we've made it. We're right. safe. We're secure. There's, there's nothing for Our technology will, will solve everything for us. That is a, that is a huge error. Life on this planet is fragile. Uh, it can be diverted in its course very radically and very, very quickly. And I don't think that our civilization is resilient or strong at all. We do have some great tech, but we're so screwed up in so many ways that the, the um, tendency to specialize, for example, which is part of the success of our culture, uh, also has a has a downside. It means that people are very good at doing one thing, but not very good at doing anything else. Uh, and and uh, if you come to a, a global cataclysm, you know somebody who's a specialist in computer science isn't really going to be that much use in in feeding his, his or her family. Uh, and 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 it's why those who are most likely to survive a global cataclysm today, in my view would be the meek of the earth. It would be those few remaining hunter-gatherer populations in yeah. uh, the Amazon rainforest, you know, in, in the Namibian desert. Those few remaining hunter-gatherer populations that still exist on the earth, these are people who know how to survive. Yeah. They could pass through a horrendous global cataclysm and hardly be scratched by it. It wouldn't affect their morale. It wouldn't affect their outlook, their, their, their confidence, but it would destroy us because our confidence is no longer based in our own abilities. It's based in what society as a whole provides us. Uh, and I think the, 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 the psychic collapse of Western civilization confronted by a huge cataclysm would be extremely rapid uh, and very, very awful. And we'd be, we, would be, we would be in a situation where people are just gunning each other down in the street very, very rapidly. We don't have the moral fiber uh, to deal with a situation like that. We've got lazy, we've got idle, we've got far too secure, far yeah. too comfortable uh, in our own wealth and privilege. And it's time that that was, that that was questioned. And I think when we, when we realize how fragile civilizations have been in the past, that even a great advanced civilization of the past may have been almost completely lost, leaving only a few traces, we have to realize that could be us too. Uh, we could be the next lost civilization. Yeah. Yes, almost, almost on a long enough time scale, destined to destined to happen, right? I think uh, ultimately, ultimately. Well, unless unless we unless we grow up and 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 and, and change things, and it and it begin it begins at the person to person level, and it spreads out to the nation to nation level. Um, the the t the time truly has come for. Uh, I mean, I I I love local cultures. Cultures are great things, but. But the notion of nations to me is yeah. a very is a passe notion. It's a notion that passed its sell by date. It's no longer it's no longer useful to us 
uh, the, 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 the notion that we should be patriotic to a particular nation has always seemed to me very puzzling and, 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 and odd. I've, I've never understood why I should feel especially loyal to Britain because I happen to be born in Britain. Yeah. So uh, I, 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 I don't see why I don't see why to spread the, the argument further to the issue of race. Why should I? Why should I especially like somebody because their skin color is roughly the same as mine? Yeah. I mean, what should we do next? Should we go around measuring colons? You know, and if, <laughs> I, if if I have the colon the same length as somebody else, then I've specially got something in common with him. I mean, yeah. the colon is a is, is an important organ, just like the skin, you know. But but we don't weigh and measure people on the size of their colon, colon. and we shouldn't weigh and measure people on the color of their skin either. And we shouldn't absolutely pit nation against nation in these, in these ridiculous struggles. We are, we are one people. One thing I've learned from traveling the world all my working life, and it's very fundamental, is that people are the same all over the world. No matter where you are, you can be in the desert, you can be in a highly sophisticated city, the same hopes, the same fears. We all love our kids. We all want to make a, a, a solid future for ourselves. People are not different from one another. The similarities between people of different cultures are far greater than the differences. And it's time we celebrated this and recognized this. Often when I say something like this, I'm accused of of wanting a world government. No, thank you. <laughs> no, yeah. I don't want a world government. I don't want any one. government. I'm an anarchist. I don't think, I don't see, I don't think we need governments, but we will, the governments persuade us that we need them. That's this right. is the, this is the, the problem. And what's needed is adult responsibility. We need to, we need to move on. We need to upgrade our consciousness to a level where the functions played by government are as minimal as possible. This this macro scale government that we have at the moment is a is, is a very destructive consequence uh, of the way our civilization has been moving. Yeah, as and as someone who's I lived in I lived in Asia, I live in the United States now. I I have friends all over the world and China. I mean, I absolutely agree with you, and I've had the same opinion about about nationality and borders and and things like that. And I, I kind of look at society, it's, it, to me, it's it's almost, you know, there's some aspects of our culture that move forward very rapidly and technologies may be one of them. But in other areas, things like government and our system of, of society and how we do that, it's just, it's stood still for hundreds of years now. And it's just, yeah, as you say, like... Well, it, no, look, at, look at how long, for example, look at how long it's taken to uh, remove criminal sanctions from the use of cannabis. Cannabis, yeah. You know, look at that. That got, that, got that, that that insane war on drugs, which has caused so much harm and so much damage. Um, that 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 has persisted for so many decades that it's still not got rid of. It's one area where I I really appreciate what the American people are doing, yeah. uh, which is state by state they are legalizing cannabis. They are basically saying, you know, fuck you to the, to government, the, the, the central authority and saying this is what we want to do. And that is that 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 is an that is an important thing. There have been so many lies told to us about cannabis in the war on drugs story. So much illusion. So much so much falsification of the facts. Uh, so we live in a culture where it's okay to get absolutely drunk on alcohol, uh, leading to all manner of car accidents, fights, physical illnesses. That's okay. But you know, if somebody smokes cannabis, then they get sent to jail. Yeah. This is obviously insane. But and, the fact that it's obviously insane hasn't prevented it staying in place for 50 years. It's it's beginning yeah. to beginning to fade out now, thanks Thank to grassroots action. Yeah, indeed, and and in in, in the states, and there's it's kind of a, a weird, um, I guess, uh, dichotomy here where it's the, the U.S. was also the one responsible for pushing that that uh, prohibition more or less yeah. across the world in the first place, and it's also the, the states that are that are now changing it at the, as you say, at that grassroots well, level. The prohibition was pushed by U S government. That's right. Well, U S government, that I should say. Liberalization is being, is being pushed by the U S people. people. There's yeah, this two is, different things. I agree. They're, they're two yeah. very different things. And this yeah. is, and this is, this is what we need more of uh, in, in, in the world is, is, is informed, informed democracy where the people can make choices where choices are not made for us by experts. I, I detest the fact, that that it is okay. It's 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 still okay in Britain for somebody to tell me what I may or may not experience in yeah. the inner sanctum of my own consciousness while doing no harm to others. This is the most invasive abuse of human rights. Indeed. If if if, if an adult cannot make decisions about their own health and their own consciousness, always with the proviso of while doing no harm to others, 
If they can't make those decisions, then they're yeah. not free in any meaningful sense. And, and in fact, the very word freedom becomes actually meaningless. It's, it's one of the things that I most like about the US is that, is that in, in, it's like a baked in concept of freedom. It has something to do with how, I guess, how the, how the country was founded. And, and it's, it's like a, yeah. it's a real fundamental part of the character here. And, it's, yeah. I, and, I, and I have that juxtaposition with Australia, which is, which is unfortunately gone in, in the opposite direction. And Terribly in the opposite direction, yeah. Yeah, my sympathies to everyone that's stuck in Australia. I mean, I couldn't go back there if I wanted to at the moment. But, but yeah, yeah. There's, if, and there's still, you know, marijuana, cannabis is a dangerous drug. It's, you know, it's, it's, they're still on that thing. But I they hopefully... Claim, they claim, to, you know, they claim to be guided by science, these people. The science right. is very clear. Mar is. Marijuana, yeah. cannabis is much, much less dangerous than alcohol. Yeah. In fact, it's not <laughs> dangerous at all. There isn't even a lethal dose of cannabis. No. You know. It's, it's, it's just a very crazy situation. And again, at the root of it is ideology. Ideology is driving this, not facts, not science, but ideology. And control is the other and thing. And control, right? yeah. Control yeah. and power, right. Because that's what people in government want to do. They want to control others. This is another shift in consciousness that needs to take place. The point of government is to serve, that's not right. to control. And if governments cease serving and maximize controlling, then we've gone terribly, terribly wrong. And that's, and that's what's happening now. But there are personality types, you know, and, and, and uh, by and large, somebody who goes into government is somebody who would like to control others yeah. and feels that they are, they, they are right to direct and guide the path of others' lives. We have to grow out of this. If the human species, however many of us that there are now, 7 billion or whatever it is, 8 billion people on planet Earth, if we're going to get through the next 100, 200 years, we're going to have to have very radical changes in consciousness that, it, that, that take place. And the enormous harm done by governments while they convince us that they're doing good for us needs to be undone. And we need to empower adults to make sovereign decisions yeah. and to, to be responsible for their own decisions. This is another mistake. The, the over-controlling governments take away the requirements requirement for us to be responsible for ourselves they mm. hand that responsibility over to some state bureaucracy or some state body and it's a terrible mistake and it yes. won't and it won't work right Look at the scale that we're now looking at it yeah and there's and there's right, like you say there's a slow mechanism that's starting to happen that that generates that change in consciousness and i think that has a lot to do with with, with psychedelics and things like cannabis and just and people also the power of the internet which is I, I often see as you know it's a, a remarkable thing where you can now be educated from anywhere in the world, but it's a, it's a knife that cuts both ways too. I can, it's it's also something that can completely consume or just you know you can mindlessly entertain yourself on it and, and never sort of look up from 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 uh, absolutely. All of absolutely. It's a it's a, a mixed gift uh, or a poisoned chalice in yes. some ways, but I'd I'd still rather have it than not have it Indeed. Um, because it has. It has given a voice to some extent to the powerless. Back, go back 20 years from the point of view of an author. Let's say go back 25 years to when I published <laughs> Fingerprints of the Gods in 1995 or 26 years. Yeah. Um, and, and you would find at that time that the, the mainstream media controlled everything. If you wanted to get your message out to a, a broad general public, there was no other way to do it except to channel it through the mainstream media, a big newspaper serializing your book or a big TV, TV channel running an interview with you. Right. Well, that's all changed. And, and, and I welcome that change. I think it's a great change because now we have this means where people can speak directly to one another. Of course, there are teething problems. Of course, there are difficulties. Of course, there's a lot of misinformation with the, with the information. But that's also part of what comes with being a responsible adult is that we have to sift information for ourselves and figure out what's right and what's wrong and what and what works for us we don't have to wait to for some expert to tell us what we need to think you know fuck experts in my view yes. we're all experts yeah. we all should empower ourselves with that notion that that we do not need to be told what to think we can think for ourselves, ourselves. we do not need to be led we can lead ourselves. This is yeah. the next step forward for the human race. Indeed. Yeah, well said. 
Um, so maybe let me circle back a little bit to the to the lost civilization as a, and we can we can kind of wrap this, uh, do a, like a final topic on this if you like. Because uh, so one thing I've always wondered about is what's your opinion on what that uh, lost civilization may have looked like, and from a couple of different aspects here is 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 one is that obviously there's. Uh, there is evidence, and, and, and we've had hunter-gatherer cultures. We've had a Stone Age all through the, the, the Pleistocene uh, mm -hmm. in, in that era. And then the other, the other angle that I'm interested in uh, recently is, is the intermingling, because you know, we've got modern humans go back maybe as far as 300, 350,000 years with the, the find in Morocco. But we also, in that period, have many other forms of humans. And, and that whole that, that, that fa extended family, if you like, has been recently extended with there's the dragon man skull that's been recently discovered in China. There's been another he species may well discovered. Be a Dennis, okay, Denisovan. There's maybe he may be that maybe. that skull may be of a Denisovan individual. If so, it would be the first Denisovan skull to have been to have been discovered. Because before that, it's like uh, a pinky, right, from a Denisovan. Yeah, yeah, we don't, uh, and you know, the complete genome was derived from that pinky. So we, we we don't know. But what's become clear is that our our picture of the past. <laughs> had been very limited until the Neanderthal genome was sequenced, which was right. 2010. You know, there was a completely false notion of the Neanderthals. Uh, and that the, the, the notion that, of course, human beings never interbred with them. Well, that went out the window with the genome because we know we did. We did. <laughs> uh, and in fact, we are the Neanderthals today. We were friendly. The, the, the Neanderthals survive in anatomically modern humans, about 4% of G DNA in some That's populations. Right. In yeah. case of Denisovans, some populations, particularly in Australasia, um, these these ancient species are part of the human story, and there's evidence that they certainly were not stupid. There's there's more and more evidence coming out now that the Neanderthals were were doing cave art. They probably taught cave art to anatomically modern humans, uh, rather than the the other way around. Our our special position, the so-called special <laughs> position, um, is being is being uh, healthily undermined. By the, yeah. we realize that we're a very we're part of a very, very complex process rather than a very simple and and direct process. But what would the lost civilization have looked like? Is is where you came into with this point. Yeah. Um, I think the first the first point I need to make is that uh, the world we live in today uh, is a world uh, where we have a highly advanced civilization. I, I think we can fairly speak of, of a global civilization. I don't think we even need to use the words like the West or the East anymore. No. I, think, I think it's a global, a, a global technological civilization has, has arisen in this world and it's capable of extraordinary feats. You know, a, a country that was absolutely on the poverty line 50 or 60 years ago, China is now sending missions to Mars. You know? yeah. um, we're, we're, um, we're, we're, we're a highly advanced, technological global culture but we coexist with hunter-gatherers i spoke a few moments ago about the hunter-gatherers in the amazon some of whom don't even know that our civilization exists the so-called uncontacted tribes Tribes. the the hunter-gatherers in namibia well they know we exist but they they choose not to coexist with us too much um so the notion that hunter-gatherer cultures could have in the past coexisted with an advanced civilization uh, is not a ridiculous idea at all because that's what happens today. We have an advanced civilization coexisting with hunter-gatherer cultures. And if our advanced civilization were destroyed by a global cataclysm and there were survivors, those survivors would be smart to go and seek refuge amongst hunter-gatherers. That's what they should do because the hunter-gatherers are the masters of survival. And they would be the ones who the survivors might try to transfer some of their technology to. And that's what I think we're looking at in terms of Gobekli Tepe. But I don't think that, uh, that the, the proposed lost civilization was a mirror image of our own. Oh, no. Yeah. At all. I think it was, I think it was very different. I think it Small. emerged out of shamanism and out of, uh, and out of the techniques of ecstasy that are used in shamanism. And, and I think altered states of consciousness were a very important and essential part of that. Um, and just because we do everything through mechanical advantage and leverage doesn't mean that they did that. I, I've, I've often said this, but it's, it, it strikes me as, as likely to be true that the more we depend on machines and computers and calculators to, to work everything out, the, 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 
the more uh, abilities within us become dormant, abilities which we could develop. Um, I mean, for example, let's say this is something, of course, my critics will immediately jump on me and call me a pseudoscientist. But let's say there is such a thing as telepathy. Let's say there is such a thing as telepathy. Well, once you've got the written word, uh, telepathy becomes less and less necessary. It begins to be replaced by the written word. And, and soon, uh, if that ability is dormant in human beings, it would go to sleep completely and would no, and would no longer be used. And I, I suspect that the lost civilization of the Ice Age uh, was able to do remarkable material things, but they probably did them in different ways than we do. And it's not good enough to say, oh, that's just pseudoscience. There are many different ways to do things. We've followed one particular track, but I think they probably followed others. And so I take seriously sound being used to yep. levitate enormous blocks of stone. And we do have modern science, which is doing levitation on a small scale with sound already. It's not a ridiculous idea uh, and, and anymore. Um, it, 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 you know, it makes it makes perfect sense to me. The, 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 the notion of, of magicians uh, who who come and bring their skills to a place dismissed as pseudoscience sure. yet I think there's an, an old saying you know magic is just science we don't yeah. understand that's that's exactly right and I, I look at the past in a similar light but I guess from a technological perspective but in the in the in the sense that we've progressed down a particular technological path and it, it, it is entirely possible indeed very likely that there exist entire realms of other forms of technology yeah. that are more organic based. So, so, so people often say, why didn't they build? Why didn't they build the pyramids if they were so advanced out of you know metals and structures and lightweight? Com like we we do that because we need to make lightweight, strong material. But if yeah. you have you, if you have an effort, effortless ability to work with organic material like granite or basalt or limestone, then you you have no need to develop titanium alloys and all these other things. It's and I yes. think in you know a hundred years, a thousand years, we'll know much more about technology and and that's why i think it's so important to look at these things with with, with an open and mind if you, were, if you were a wise civilization you might choose not to pursue particular routes of technology right right plastics we and unwisely <laughs> have pursued yes you know yeah. we have pursued so so we're never going to find ourselves in the past that's right. not what we're going to find and no. if we look for ourselves in the past we won't find ourselves but we we do find evidence of a much higher level of civilization during the Ice Age right. than the mainstream presently gives our Ice Age ancestors credit for. Uh, and I think one of the best examples of that, re really, really useful example, is uh, the survival of ancient maps oh, that show yeah. the world as it looked during the Ice Age. In longitude. Maps, now we know that the, 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 the history of these maps is complex because the ones that have come down to us uh, were made in the 15th, 16th centuries, mm -hmm. but they were copied from older source maps which are now lost, and they conveyed the contents of those source maps onto their new maps, and they mixed it together with right. discoveries from the age of discovery. But when you start looking at those maps in detail, you know whether it's the Orontius Phineas map or some of the Mercator maps, you realize that you're looking at things that don't make sense according to the knowledge of, of the 15th or 16th century. Yeah. You see, for example, Antarctica depicted yeah. on those maps. Our civilization didn't discover Antarctica until 1820. Um, but it's there on maps in the 1500s that were copied from much older source maps now lost That's going right. back, we know in some cases, to the library of Alexandria. Yeah. Um, you see an enormously extended Southeast Asia, very much like the Sunda Shelf, which was exposed and above water uh, during, during the Ice Age. Like and mini road. very sneakily, you see very precise uh, relative longitudes. And that tells you you're dealing with science. Uh, because we couldn't do longitude until the middle of the 18th century. And when I find uh, it was just an unknown, it was a dream of all navigators that somehow they could fix longitude. Yeah. But until a marine chronometer was invented that could keep accurate time at sea, longitude was impossible. So to find accurate longitudes on these maps that were copied in the 1500s from much older source maps tells yeah. us there's something really wrong with the way we're understanding our past. That's right. Yeah, not until James Cook's second voyage of discovery did we were we able to do it. I mean, that's where that old running down an easting or running down a westing came from because they they had to you know fix the go north and west until they hit where they wanted and then they would 
then they would travel, I think. Uh, oh, sorry, there was even a big prize. A prize was offered for That's solving right, for the electric problem. And I think it went yeah. to Harrison for his chronometer. That's right. Uh, which finally could keep accurate time at sea. Well, it's that's 18th century technology. Um, but to find evidence of 18th century <laughs> technology in the Ice Age is, uh, is, is, is pretty disturbing to yeah. the, the mainstream paradigm. It is. It's even reflected in the Great Pyramid. I don't know if you, this is uh, the, 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 when you take the, the perimeter of the, pyram of the Great Pyramid and the ratio of its perimeter to the ratio of the sockle, which is this little uh, the shelf that it sits on that's about you know, this much wider, that perimeter is the exact ratio of latitude and to longitude on the planet being an oblate sphere. We're slightly more mm -hmm. east to west than we are north to south. So there's, there's some evidence that suggests that the, 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 the accurate measurement of the planet and the, the ratio of latitude to longitude is reflected in the dimensions of the Great Pyramid. It's crazy. Well, there, uh, I've been convinced of this for, 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 for a long time. Uh, and it goes back to my readings of um, Hamlet's Mill. I don't know if you've oh, yes. come across. It. I have a copy of it here. It's it's a it's a fun it's read. Incredibly that's... important book. It's yeah. an incredibly important book, which is largely ignored by mainstream scholarship today. It but is. Giorgio de Santillana was the professor of the history of science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Hertha von Deschend, his co-author, was professor of the history of science at Frankfurt University. These were serious, serious people. Yeah. Uh, and what they found was an ancient knowledge of the phenomenon called precession of the equinoxes. Uh, and precession of the equinoxes, I'm not going to bore your <laughs> listeners with a long and detailed description, but fundamentally it changes the background stars against which the sun is seen to rise uh, at particular key moments of the year, the solstices and the equinoxes is when it's most noticeable. And this process is caused by a wobble on the axis of the earth itself. And because that's our viewing platform, the changes in its orientation affect the star field. These changes take place at the rate of one degree every 72 years. Uh, and these numbers, based on the number 72, 30 times 72 is 2,160, 60 times 72 is 4,320. These numbers appear all over the world in mythology, all around the world, tied up with imagery of a giant mill turning. And Santillana and Von Deschen make an impeccable case that what these traditions are, are recording is detailed knowledge of the precession of the equinoxes thousands of years before the Greeks supposedly discovered the procession. And this is where the Great Pyramid gets interesting because, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure you know this, that the, you, you've already mentioned the latitude longitude, the, 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 the height of the Great Pyramid yeah. multiplied by 43,200 gives you the polar radius, radius of the of Earth. The Earth. And the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid multiplied by 43,200 gives you the equatorial circumference of the Earth. And that would be quite easy to dismiss of a, as a coincidence if it wasn't 43,200. But 43,200 is one of those numbers generated by precession of the equinoxes, where the base is 72 years for one degree. So it's 600 times 72. So what we have is a geometrical scale model, which gives us the dimensions of the Earth, and it does so on a scale set by a key motion of the earth itself indeed no, <laughs> i mean it's crazy. you know this cannot be an accident no this is this is very very clever workmanship that's gone into this and 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 evidence of high science in 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 remote antiquity and it just astonishes me that the mainstream ignores all of this yeah. and and doesn't even want to go there and, and that's and that's it's another example of of how we pass data down through time it's not just you know uh, uh eyewitness accounts of, of cataclysmic events, but there is actual astronomical data encoded in these myths and legends that have even passed through cultures that should have had no understanding of it whatsoever. That's what I found remarkable about, yeah. about Hamlet's Mill. That's, Absolutely. It's, it, and and it's, it's, almost as, it's almost as though, and actually Satyana and Van Deschent hint, hint at this because they attribute this knowledge to some almost unbelievable <laughs> ancestor civilization. Yeah, I imagine um, it's almost It's almost as though a group of people set down to permanently memorialize this information and to pass it down to the future. And the fundamental message they were sending was take us seriously. Yeah. We knew our stuff. We had worked out the precession of the equinoxes. We knew the dimensions of the earth. We knew the earth was a sphere. We had mapped the entire world take us seriously and unfortunately that is what mainstream archaeology is not doing at the moment it is not taking the voices of the past seriously unless it's some king's inscription you know uh, or, or right. some duke or earl yeah indeed 
Yes, and it's. I mean, the other the, there's other connections too that seem to come from that common ancestor. One of the things I loved about America before was the connection you made between the cultures of the mound builders and the yeah. ancient Egyptians from you know spiritual beliefs, religious beliefs, and then in particular the role of the astronomer seemed to be just a Such remarkable, astonishing, astonishing, remarkable comparisons. And I and I'm not suggesting that that ancient Egyptians went to North America and passed on their <laughs> ideas to Native Americans. What I'm suggesting is that both Native American cultures and the ancient Egyptian cultures were the inheritors of a legacy from a much earlier culture that was shared and common to both and that passed down the same information in, in both places. And that's why you get these astonishing similarities, which, which otherwise simply cannot be explained. Indeed, yes. All right, well, Graham Hancock, thank you so much. It's been uh, it's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you and speaking with you again. Thanks for your time. I greatly appreciate it. My pleasure. Really nice to talk to you again as yeah. well. Thanks for having me on the show. You too. Cheers. <laughs>